I am a sound editor, sound designer, sound mixer, sound effects recordist, but I thought I would introduce myself by reading a, um, a letter to the editor that I wrote to the LA Times a few years ago after having seen um, someone write uh, a piece on why rap music wasn't real music. So, and that, that hit me the wrong way. So this, this, is gonna, this is the way I'm going to introduce myself because I think it says a little bit about what we all do. And then because um, I've been busy on Jack up until like yesterday, um, I haven't prepared an official presentation, so I, I'm, I want this to be a Q&A. I have some notes and things that if, if the wheels come off, I can, we can, I can trigger some discussions with some ideas, but I'm hoping you all have questions and I'll, I'm happy to answer and tell you anything you want to know. So that's sort of going to be the structure of this, which is no structure. Ask, <laughs> ask me how to solve to problems. <laughs> ask me whatever you want, and I'm happy to answer it. But anyways, so here's, here's this, my response to this cat who thought that rap music wasn't music. Bravo, Dan Willis. If your Music 101 courses tell you music is organized sounds and silences that occur in specific time and are reproducible, then I have been composing for you for 23 years. My compositions contain meters and rhythms that incrementally change from moment to moment in very sophisticated, non-traditional ways, unencumbered by the modern conventions of bars, meter, and tempo. My compositions include enharmonic intervals, unhummable melodies, and found sound that utilize a panoply of instruments and tonalities unrecognizable to most modern composers or musicians. Yet, they are no less engaging dramatic or musical. I spend months orchestrating every instrument in my work and unlike most traditional composers, invent or create new instruments for each new work of mine. My works are infinitely reproducible. My works contain structure, are organized, and the deliberate uses of silence, dynamics, pitch, timber, rhythm, and timing. Just like Sikh, Stravinsky, or Satchmo, those artists chose more conventional routes to express the muse within them by working within artistically acceptable confines of meter, rhythm, instrumentation, and tonality. I work outside the mainstream. I would love to publish my sheet music, but no orchestras currently exist to perform it. <laughs> you can plunk down five bucks to hear it in a movie theater, or you can rent my work in a local video store. You have been manipulated and moved by it your entire film-going life. Do you know what I do? Don't feel bad. Most filmmakers don't either. <laughs> so that, I think, kind of describes my view of the world of sound design, sound editing, sound recording, and sound mixing. And that's kind of what I aspire to. I see myself as, a, as every bit as much a composer as a, a composer does. I've played guitar all my life, and I continue to play guitar and write, and I've had songs published and songs in movies. And I came to California wanting to be in a band. I moved out with a bandmate thinking we would start a band, which was a, you know, an unbelievably bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, I, I had a B plan, which was that, um, uh, I would get into film somehow because all my life as a kid, I was in a stop motion, you know, I had my dad's eight millimeter film based movie camera and I made animation. So, uh, and which is in fact how I initially got into the business. My first job was at Hanna-Barbera Studios, the guys that make Scooby-Doo and the Flintstones and Huckleberry Hound and like that. And that work, my, that, my, that interest in animation got me an interview, but got me into the sound department at Hanna-Barbera, which I knew nothing about. I never went to film school. I didn't know that people do what we do for a living. This was a complete mystery to me. Um, but it got me in the sound department, and I think because I have a good ear and I've played all my life, uh, it, it, uh, I, it carried me in good stead. But um, sort of anecdotally to that, I dropped out of college to come here, and my major was foreign languages. And in an amazing sort of turn of events, all of that ended up aiding me because I have a great facility with language and um, structure of language. And I've, I do a lot of creature voice and alien voice design work and language creation work. And all that language study 
just, it, it was just, I was, it just, you know, who knew? Who knew that was all going to pay off somehow? I just, I realized in my sophomore year, I didn't want to be a UN interpreter. And uh, <laughs> that was a dead end. So I came here trying to seek fame and fortune as a guitarist and ended up in the movie business. I could talk all night about Fifth Element because it was a, a truly an amazing experience, starting with Luc Besson because he, he was everything that I imagined a French director should be. I mean, he was, he was just like the supreme artist who trusted all the people that worked for him and gave them the creative freedom to go and do what they do and present what they wanted to present, unfettered and unmicromanaged. And so it was, uh, it was just a dream come true to work for him. In fact, um, I'll get to the Mandashuans and the Mangalores in a second, but don't let me forget. Um, one of the great things about Luke was I had been on the film a week. We, we never spotted the film. He just said, go and do what you do. And, you know, being, being part of sort of a Hollywood, um, the Hollywood kind of mold of the way things get done, I, I went away and dutifully started pr making my first batches of sounds. I had to make all the air cars, and I wanted him to hear them right away and, and like them. So a week in, I called a, a playback session and played him all my cars, and, you know, I had gotten to the third cue, and he said, okay, that's all good, thank you, and he left. And, I, and the next time I saw him was at playback of the final mix of Real One. Every time, the ne you know, next, the following week, I wanted to play for him like Corbin's ship. And he was like, no, don't worry about it. And it was like that for nine months until we got to final mix. And he was just the most amazing guy that way because he trusted everybody. He was, he was like, to me, he was like, he's very French, you know. He was. That particular project was unique because I actually hired Van Ling to write, to invent the language for me. So once I had the words, the rest of it was up to me to record voices and do the processing. So the, um, oh, I guess 97, the Mangalores, which were the sort of bulldoggy looking kind of bad guys, started life as casting sessions to get the sort of timbre of voice that we want. We knew bad guys have to have deep gravelly voices so we cast about for a few weeks to get five or six guys that had a facility with saying sometimes mumble mumbo jumbo words um, and also had the a variety of interesting sort of deep gravelly growly timbres but I knew I needed them to be kind of animalistic sounding so I called a kit of mostly tigers and pit bulls little sort of growly phrases and I had our dialogue editor Kurt Schulke sort of mod cut them to all the um, um, to, to the to the performance but like every um, syllable I would cut a, a, a like a syllable of a growl uh, I mean like a tiger or pit bull utterance there's there's a like a dial an ADR matching program that used to exist and I can't re vocal line Thank you. That we used to do a, a certain amount of envelope matching so that we would get pitch variants that would track the pitch variants in the voice and envelope variants based on the envelope of the voice. And we would overlay that across the animal samples that were already cut to the syllables. So it was already cut like crude ADR. And then we would take that vocal line version of the animal sounds and um, vocode them. We'd, we'd feed them the raw ADR signal and then the vocal line signal into a, a vocoder and take that bit out, record that again, and then balance that back against the dry voice, which we did some amount of pitch shifting depending on the character. One of the other voices that we did that was really cool is um, with the guy that played, we, we hired this guy with this he was, a, he was an alaryngeal, he, the, meaning he's missing his larynx, and he speaks out of his stoma. And he was the voice of what Luke called the bad. Like when, um, when the black stuff starts to drool down his head, Gary Oldman, he's having a conversation with the head evil guy who you never see. That was, um, that was this guy that we, we found, that I had found when I researched gremlins who didn't have a larynx and spoke through the hole in his throat. 
and he could he could speak by burping. I mean, if, I mean, it sounds weird, but what, what all that means is you take in air and then control the expulsion of the air and modulate it. And uh, we we took that and we used another technique I used on one of the Star Trek movies for a God voice, where we record him um, Dolby SR encoded, but then play it back non decoded, and it adds this sort of really interesting high frequency shimmer and a bunch of low frequency stuff that you don't get with an EQ. And it's, of course, it's modulated by, by volume. And it just gave it this big sort of beefy, beefy sound. We, we can talk about the Jack, the Giant Slayer, Giant Voices. Even back then, I was using a, a technique that I discovered the first day I ever had a tape recorder, which is to get the proximity effect of a microphone right up here, to get those really deep chest resonances and work a mic this far away. Uh, and that's part of the secret of getting some of those really big, kind of imposing sounding voices, which is how we did all the giant voices on Jack. The, the process is usually pretty much the same. In the gathering phase, it's always just gather. I, I never want to be distracted thinking too far ahead. I just want to make sure I'm capturing the great sound. Um, and then, I, I always knowing that the, the magic for me happens in the studio by myself. Um, and you never know when that's going to happen. So you just know you're going to dig in, you're going to put up the raw recordings. So the first thing you have to do is kind of winnow them down. Get all the dead air out, throw away the bad sh stuff that you don't want, get it down to the meat. Oh, and this, this is a good story. And in fact, I'll show some pictures of this too. I'll pass this laptop around. I did this movie, Mr. Popper's Penguins, and it had six Gen 2 penguins in it. There are no studio quality recordings of Gentoo penguins anywhere in the world. <laughs> they have to be below freezing uh, or else they're not very happy. So um, uh, the only recordings I could find were like sort of National Geographic documentary filmmaker stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're out on the whatever that is that they go out on and hang a mic and they're 50 yards away. Or even if they come close, there's wind and there's seagulls and you there are just... When to stop or anything. You have to no, you start. can't do anything of the sort. And I tried the, um, the sort of isotope thing on that stuff and that was less than successful and it has its artifacts. So I had this idea that we would um, record Gentoo penguins while they're just not f available for rent like an elephant or a, <laughs> or a tiger. In fact, there is one guy in the world with a batch of a, a batch of them, and he parades them around the world for zoos and displays, and he and he makes a an increase he's like a millionaire from these six Gen Two penguins, oh, really? and like the ASPCA is after this guy, and he, it's 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 silly. But we found him, and we found out that he has a fee, and um, he has a refrigerated truck that he keeps them in, like a tractor trailer truck. But as you can imagine. Um, you know, it's got air conditioning and it's in a big metal thing. So I thought this is going to be a problem. So I, I convinced 20th Century Fox to build a Penguin ADR stage. Oh my God. <laughs> that must have been the, the production, well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> there were some scratched heads, but they did it. They dropped $5,000 and we built it in New York where the penguins were being kept at that point. They, they bought a, um, a tractor trailer the same size, you know, like would be you know, like you'd ship, uh, you know, whatever clothes in or something. And we sound isolated the entire interior with sound acoustic foams and stuff like that. We dampened the air conditioning feed because you have to keep them at 32 or below, or actually 40 or below, but they're most comfortable 32 or below. And then we built a holding area and then the ADR booth for the penguins. Because what we could do is, it was like that was the super isolated spot where there wasn't any air conditioning duct, even though we had, we had uh, isolated it. And we'd keep five penguins over here in the holding area, and then we'd usher one into the ADR booth and wait. Now, penguin, <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to get to the point eventually talking about winnowing material down because Penguins are, are completely unlike any other animal. The only thing you can train penguins to do is to go from where the food isn't to where the food is. That's all, you can't prod them, you can't poke them, you can't make them angry. So in other words, you can't make them make sound until they're just ready to do it. So my good friend Ben Chia, who's a fine sound effects recordist in New York, spent three days 
in this isolation tank waiting for whatever utterances we were going to get. And over the course of three nine-hour days of him just waiting with his shotgun mic, <laughs> waiting for them to do something, we got a total winnowed down of five minutes wow. of, of total hours. So from 24, 24 hours, we got eight, uh, five minutes of, of utterances. But it was gold once you got it down to, because within that was everything the Gen 2 penguins can do. Um, and then from there, once I got those elements and I got the basic gist of their vocabulary, and they only do about five things, they, well, I won't go into that. They, <laughs> they do like five things. I realized I needed a larger palette. So that's when I started using pitch, time expansion, compression, um, e you know, editing, you know, just clever editing stuff to make utterances that, you know, if a penguin just goes, Squaw! I'd make a spark, 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 and it would, you'd have like a little multi-syllabic word. And there's even a spot in the movie, I'm, I, and I, I, you know, you think of these things after the fact. I even have a penguin fuck you. There's a moment where, <laughs> where um, Jim Carrey like yells at one of them and the other one, he kind of, he doesn't say fuck you, but it sounds like it to me. He sounds like, spark, spark, like that. And like, I'm, I'm really proud of the penguin fuck you, because the censors never heard it. And it's, it's in the movie. And then it's just a fun editing job of, and then I make masters. Then I, I sort of repurpose all of it and, and uh, um, consolidate, you know, the words and phrases as, as a single utterance instead of all these edits in it. And I make a library. And so the Penguin library is somewhere on the order of 100 to 120 audio files. And that goes into the Penguin kit. And I gave that to Tim Walston at Sound Deluxe, and he became the Penguin editor. And so, and you know, and he has this nice concordance in the sound library of here's the 120 files, and here's a description. This is Penguin upset, but not too upset. This is Penguin cuddly. This is Penguin in love. Because I had to make all these emotions with all these sounds. So he had, it was very easy to sort of grab from the library, drag them to the timeline, start laying them up to the, the scene, and seeing what fit, and then actually fine cut them to what the beaks were actually doing. So that's how those voices were made. <laughs> For myself, I, I try to cast myself um, modestly in the, in the mold of Ben Burt and uh, Alan Splett and Walter Murch as a, what I consider to be a true sound designer, which is to say, I want to be, and I want, I want the director to see me as the one person who he will entrust his vision for the entire soundtrack to. And so you can make of that whatever you want to make of that, but I can tell you in my worldview, that includes everything including the score, which is to say the movie doesn't work if the score and the sound effects don't work together. Therefore, it's incumbent upon me to be proactive in how that works. And I don't mean that in any kind of antagonistic way whatsoever. I mean, it's, it means that I have to be responsible for that working even when it's to my detriment. In other words, if I see that a composer is going off the rails, it's my job to be the director's confidant even when he doesn't hear it, even when the composer is his best friend. It's, and in fact, that, that, I think that's a really good um, first place to begin. The single biggest value that I have to a director is honesty. And you have to take those risks. You don't know you have a director until you, you know you can tell him anything, including that scene sucks. Because that's what we get paid for. We get paid to have an opinion. And the, the stronger your opinion is, the more value, valuable you are to filmmakers. So. Given all of that, given that arrogant assumption on my part, I feel as though it's my job to be 100% responsible for everything that you hear in a movie. That means I am in the face of the dialogue department, the ADR department, the wallet department, the Foley department, the scoring department, the music department, the dailies department, the sound effects editors, the sound designers, this field recordist, it's my job to control the horizontal and the vertical because they hired me to make that perfect, to make what's on the screen perfect. And if there's something wrong, it's because I didn't attend to it. I d there should never be a point in a mix 
where the director says, this isn't working. I mean, they say that all the time, but I have to have an answer for it or have thought through why it isn't working and be ready to say, you know, we went down this road for these reasons, we can fix it this way, or um, here's another solution. That's a very complicated and delicate process, as you can imagine. And I think because I'm a guitarist and I have a fair amount of musical training, um, I have the facility to speak fairly intelligently with composers. Therefore, I can engender trust in the filmmaker to know so that he knows or she knows that I can meet with the composer and, and have a, like a smart conversation about how do we want to achieve things. And look, it, it starts with what do I see for the movie? I, my job is to be a filmmaker first and a sound designer second. So when I look at a scene, I'm, my first thought is, what are the sound effects for this scene? My first thought is, what is the sound of this scene? And I am the first guy in any spotting session to say, this is going to be awesome if we just do this with score. This is, or, you know what I can do here? Can we consider not having score here and have it feather in like this and, and come out like that? And all that does is opens up the discussion. It tells the filmmaker, you're engaged and you're on his team. You're not on your team. And that, all it means is just like if you're just doing the sound, sound effects part of it, it opens up a discussion of what works. And then that starts the experimentation process. The composer goes off and does something. He plays around and he, he says, you know, Mark, I really want to go four measures longer here because I want to cover this bit. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's do that. Or I call back and say, I really need to have the, uh, the dream sequence start here because I'm going to introduce this sound that I'm going to reference later in the movie. And I want to introduce it here where you're still not out yet. What do you think about that? And you just go back. It's like fighting with your wife. You know, you shouldn't have <laughs> spent that money. Well, I needed to for the, you know, and before you know, it, you realize, okay, here's the answer to the problem. You do it through healthy debate rather than, you know, last minute fights of fights for territory. And I think that's what the filmmaking process is all about, is healthy discussion. Th be willing to throw out, have the balls to throw out an idea and say, I think it'd be awesome if we did th this. And sometimes they say, ah, oh, that sucks. That's been done before. Or, hey, I never thought of that. Isn't it great when you get that, hey, I never thought of it? That's, that's the fence that I'm aiming for is, hey, I never thought of that. And I feel as though if you get one in 10 of those, you're doing great and uh, you, you got to keep it up. Set aside time. Um, I'm I'm highly anally retentive, so um, I have when I sit down to do a project, one of the first things I do is a budget, and it, that budget is an extremely detailed roadmap of exactly what's being done any given, pretty much week. Now, I don't budget it. I mean, I I don't micromanage it down. Well, I don't micromanage, let's first say that. But I know on any given week the goals that have to be accomplished. I need real three backgrounds cut in week seven. So given that, I have a really clear roadmap of how to get to where I need to go. I know when real four fully has to be shot and when it ha how long it takes to cut it and when it should be cut and when, how much time it takes to review the reel and do the, do, do the notes and the updates. And then when the mix for that reel is, I know when all that is supposed to happen within an error, uh, you know, a, a range, a margin of error of five, 10 percent, you know, nothing ever goes the way you want it to in movie making. So I have a very clear roadmap of how long I want something to take. The beauty of that is there's always surprises. You know, there's, I, I allocate a week to design a scene or a sequence. And after, at the end of the week, I go sit with the designer or the editor and it's not working. Let's keep working on it. And it chews up two weeks, then three weeks. And I'm starting to feel nervous about it. But other times there's another sequence that I budgeted a week for and it, he did it in a day and it's great. I have a really good sense of how long it generally takes to do something given the budget that I'm working with. So for example, I was on Jack the Giant Slayer for a year and four months. And that's a long time to do a lot of stuff. Now, just before that, I had done a super low budget movie for like, you know, six weeks. So I, you know, I'm not going to allocate the same amount of time for sound effects editing of a reel for that movie as Jack the Giant Slayer because I know you can't do it. So I know what to expect when somebody gets a day to cut a reel versus a month to cut a reel. I know what to expect from all of that. So I scale everything accordingly. And I am very loyal to, I've been working with the same guys for 30 years. So 
they know what I like, I know what they do, I hand them a reel and um, I don't micromanage. I, they, they cut the reel, they call me with questions during the day, at the end of the week or the two weeks or the day, I watch the reel, I give them notes. It ranges you know, from anywhere from five to 10% of stuff that I want to have different. Not necessarily because they did it wrong, but we discovered together, oh, this is how that all pulled, up, pulled together. This is the direction we should go in. Then they go off and do it. One, one constant in my life is the shower epiphany in the morning. Um, I, I'm, ju I'm just, my brain is most fertile and fecund around 7 to 7.30 when I take a shower. So generally, I go to bed with a problem, and I'm, I'm wor I have anxiety about how I'm going to tackle a problem, and I wake up, and somewhere in that relaxing, steam-bathed moment in the shower, <laughs> Uh, as, uh, an, uh, an approach will present itself, it, but that's, I, that is not fully um, reproducible. But, uh, you know, as with anything, sometimes I read a script and the, the, the prose is such that I get an immediate oral image in my mind and I know exactly where I'm going. I know the things I'm going to record to start as raw elements with. Sometimes it's in the spotting session with the director. Sometimes the directors tell you, I want it to sound green, or I want it to sound like Satchmo, or something like that. You know, whatever the crazy metaphor is. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and if they don't do that, then I sit with a film for weeks usually, spotting and spotting and spotting by myself, running scenes back and forth, wishing and hoping for inspiration. Kind of like a writer at his desk with his pen or his word processor, it's like, you know where you need to go, you start scratching something out, and you cross it out. And so sometimes I'll browse the library, sometimes I'll do a, a very random search, because I'm trying to trigger, I'm trying to make random connections that I can't logically make. So I'll, I'll play this kind of Russian roulette thing on my browser and my library, and I'll just, I'll just go and see what comes up and hit play. Oh, look at that. And, um, and I, I'll just play a sound, it's a trash can, it's a mouse squeak, whatever it is, but somehow then I'll make the random, fortuitous, serendipitous connection, mouse squeak. Mouses make me think of cheese, cheese makes me think of baking, baking makes me think of my wife, my wife makes me think of kissing, my kissing makes me think of, I got it! Squishy sounds, and then, and, then I'm, and then I'm there. So free association is a huge part of it, so that sort of serendipity um, library process is is a really great one for me and then there's just sweat there's just I am a huge believer in this sort of old world Italian notion of working hard sometimes you just grit your teeth and just start doing it and work pull a shitty sound you know that doesn't work and milk it and process it and it's like find the problems with it and the problems create the epiphanies for you look up John, on YouTube, John Cleese on creativity. He gave a great lecture. Has any of you seen this? This lecture he gave in Nor Norway or Sweden or some Nordic country. There's an amazing lecture that he gives that once, I just saw it a few weeks ago, that validated every notion I've ever had about creativity and what I do, which is the absolute importance of creating this sacred space and time sort of bubble for yourself to allow creativity to come in because he tells it in this way that you have this um, uh, sort of analytical brain and, and you can't be creative when you're in your analytical brain and you have to create this time space moment to put that, make that cr critical brain go away. And, and until you do that, you, you can't be creative. You can't let the important creative ideas come through. And I discovered this, uh, it, Decades ago with a buddy of mine, we were stuck on a sound design moment and we sort of jokingly looked at each other like, yeah, man, let's, let's uh, meditate on this. And so we would, and so we had this goofy, we used to have, and because I'm really old, we had all our sound and quarter inch rolls and mag and 35 millimeter spools. And it was in the same room where we had our recording studio. So we had these racks and we thought if we were to, if we were to sort of, um, uh, commune with the sound, the <laughs> ideas will come to us. So we would sit down, we'd lie down in the middle of the stacks like this, and we'd cross our arms, around, and, and we would do like this goofy ohm thing, and we, and pretending like the sounds would sort of leap out of the rolls to us and give us ideas. And, um, 
But it really worked because what it did is that we were um, unconsciously acknowledging this notion of stopping the work process, taking a moment to relax, and just waiting for something to hit us. We'd, we'd, we'd just take this little nap for 15 minutes <laughs> in, the, in the sound library, and we'd get ideas that way. There's several techniques that I use to, to allow that to happen. Um, one, a really stupid one, is the, the Brian Eno, um, what are those cards he made? Oblique. Yeah, the oblique strategies. Um, that, that's sort of why I think those things are really good, or can be good as, a, as one option to break the, the, the block, is because they all recommend doing something that takes you out of being in the middle of what you think you're in the middle of. It's oblique because it has nothing to do with what, what you're trying to achieve. Um, the other thing that I discovered serendipitously is that creativity is blocked when you're not in touch with your emotions. And what that means is the absolute guaranteed way I know to create, break a creative block is to go cry somehow. So if I can find... If, I had a horrible image, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, I promise, I'm not going to do it tonight. Man, this sound isn't working at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. For me, there's something about the, that emotional release. I don't know if it's endorphins or what shit's going on inside of my body that breaks the block immediately. I, as soon as I have a moment like that, my creative juices start flowing. So um, because of that, because of my discovery of that, I've started taking acting classes and I recommend it highly. This year, I'm in my second year of comedy improv classes and I highly recommend this. I do not want to be a comedian. It has nothing to do with it. It comes from my conviction that when you learn to be in touch with that weird open mind that allows you to make the weird connections that comedians make, you can use that in sound design to make those other serendipitous connections of what should a, a silver sounding tuba looking space alien sound like? I think it's a little easier once you've developed the muscle. Comedy is, is a muscle that you have to work on just like your biceps and your quads when you're an athlete. And once you develop that muscle, it just comes faster and it's really starting to work for me now. I'm sure you've heard this whole 10,000 hour thing and 10 year thing. Um, there's this whole new branch of study about, in science about muscle memory. And my interpretation of that is this, that you take, take a great athlete or a great musician, they spend hours in the practice field or hours in the practice room on the mechanics of the technique. You got to have the mechanics down and it has to become second nature. The reason is, is that um, you don't need to know in the performance mode, which is the critical time when you have to use that stuff somehow, that all has to be second nature because your mind has to be in that open space that I talked about earlier so that you can call on them subconsciously because you're in touch with your, your creative self in the performance mode. So the mechanical part of it, that muscle memory part of it, has to be down pat. So you have to do your shit a lot and constantly and boring and make it second nature. And I think not, at not, athletes and musicians aren't the only people that have muscle memory. We all do too after having sat behind a Pro Tools or a mix console. And unequivocal for me is I don't do anything without dialogue and music playing, ever. I never cut a sound effect without it. It is always in my edit session. Um, because as I said, to be, you have to be a filmmaker first. What you're trying to do is make the scene work and you know you got to hear the words most of the time. Yeah. Sometimes you don't need to hear the words um, and that's a choice. So I always have dialogue and sound effects playing and I, I edit and mix as I, as I build a scene always. Um, and that, now I can tell you a, a couple of good stories about that actually. Um, to be, I think to be a complete sound designer is to be responsible for all of those elements. I did this film last year called Warrior, this um, MMA film, that Nick Nolte and Tom Hardy, and a really great film. If, if you haven't seen it, I will pay you your $5 if you rent it. <laughs> I promise every one of you, you'll have your cry moment that you need by watching this movie. <laughs> um, this, this filmmaker, Gavin O'Connor, really trusted me. And 
he started uh, the film by just turning over sequences and saying, Mark, give me something. I need, this scene isn't working. He would present it to me by saying, this scene isn't working. I need you to do something here. So in the old days, I would kill myself trying to think what sound effect gets me out of this problem. What solves his problem with a sound effect? And sometimes the sound effect isn't the problem. Sometimes the scene is the problem. So there are three scenes in Warrior that after he gave them to me, I went back to my studio and I thought, what's wrong with this scene? As I started to think like a filmmaker instead of a sound designer, I realized there were a lot of things that I didn't like about the scene, starting with the way it was cut. Now, you have to be really careful <laughs> with it because this is insubordination of the highest order. But I felt like this director trusted me enough that he'd be open to me making a presentation. So if, the first time I did it, I rung him and I said, Gav, I have some ideas, but it might take a, some restructuring that you might not be familiar with. And he said, go for it, man. I want to see what you got. Because he was looking at me as a filmmaker. So first thing is, I did is I recut this scene. I, you know, I did it in Pro Tools. I did it in my timeline. You can cut Pro Tools just like a piece of sound. And I moved shots around and put some black in and I made a fade in. And it was really choppy, but it had now the structure that I thought worked for what he wanted. Then I recut the music. Now that's real <laughs> insubordination because the composer, like most sound designers, was grabbing too much territory. He was playing through a moment that really didn't want music. And Gavin was also telling me I, well, he wanted some sound designed thing at this particular beat, but the score was playing through it. And I thought, you know, I think we can do with about without four measures of this particular cue. So I recut the music. Now I had it kind of in the shape that I wanted. And I had this nice, and then I could start designing the sounds that I wanted to design for that moment. Made all that stuff made a 5-1 mix of everything, and, um, and then I think I made a stereo crash down and sent it to the cutting room. Oh, no, excuse me. I brought it over and presented it. So I had to do this like very embarrassing, like to the editor and the music editor, in the room of the director, like, okay, look guys, I don't know how to tell you this, but I made a couple of changes, but I really think it works. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just watch. So, you know, the editor plays it on the Avid, and Gavin immediately was like, Mark, that's really good, that's really good, that's really good, you really nailed it, what did you do? And so right there I knew I had him, because he didn't see the cuts in the music or the picture, all he saw was that his sequence worked. Now, now the editor was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> the music editor was a little... But I did it with such good intention that, I mean, within 10 minutes, they all realized, oh yeah, all he cared about was making this sequence work. Because as they discovered in the ensuing weeks, there were many other moments where it was a complete other mix of things when Gavin would ask me to do something. And my suggestions were, no, I don't want sound effects here. This is such a delicate moment. This distracts us because of this and blah, blah, blah. So let's please not do this. So they saw that I was invested in the movie and not invested in my own shit. And, and so, um, in fact, there, even, there was a sequence that I did that was all music design stuff. There was a, this montage of cars with music playing and the music editor had not done something the director was happy with and they were trying to track it and underscore it. And I sold him on this idea of doing sort of a American graffiti thing where we'd hear different kinds of music coming out of different cars. It would be this montage thing. And he said, yeah, go do it. So I pulled a bunch of music off of CDs and worldized it, made it cars passing by, and you really liked it. And the music editor was like, all of a sudden, now I became the music editor and started dumping stuff on me. Like, oh, look at Mark, he's the music editor. <laughs> so the Giants and Jack the Giant Killer, I did all the Giants that were the non-speaking Giants. I mean, but effectively, that's, that's dialogue. I mean, they, had, they do all sorts of crazy shit, as you'll see. And... Um, well, but, that, but actually, actually, to underline that point, and as Tom knows, I developed uh, an encyclical of how to record the raw elements for the Giants a year and a half ago. This is the microphone you're going to use, this is the sample rate, this is the distance, this is the technique, 
and that every recording studio around the world had to adhere to, so I had the raw elements that I, I needed to then go off and process them. So that wasn't something I was going to leave to some cowboy ADR mixer in London or some lazy actor in South Africa. I wasn't going to chance any of that to not getting the recordings that I knew we needed to get giant voices the way I wanted them. So I had to be involved in that because no one else the director doesn't know how to, he doesn't know how to make giant voices. The composer doesn't know how to do that. And the actors don't know how to do that. But the sound designer should. So I had an idea, so I controlled all of that. As Tom can tell, if he wants to send around the encyclical, it first starts with the very simple technique of proximity to the microphone. You need a large diaphragm condenser microphone at 96 kilohertz, um, no EQ, no dynamics in the chain, a very, very pure chain straight to Pro Tools, no monkey business, and um, having the actor work this close to the mic whether they like it or not. And then I always had a backup mic, uh, so I spec'd a U67 because I like the deep warm sort of bottom that those, those microphones get as our first choice microphones. We'd always have two, one right here and one right here. This would be my far mic. <laughs> it'd, be like, <laughs> it'd be like three inches away just in case he screamed or sneezed or did something, something awful. So we double tracked all of that and, and we would go back if, if I didn't get the chest resonance I needed because I knew that was the secret to size. I didn't want to do it with EQ and I didn't particularly want to do, want to do it with pitch and I succeeded pretty well in avoiding both to a certain degree. So it was first getting a pretty decent raw recording, really meaty, really saturated track. And then we took everything, we, we took every character that spoke and decided on a pitch and um, time expansion um, setting that gave them each a unique kind of timbre to their voice. They already had each, they were all done by different actors anyways, the speaking giants. So we went through a long process of finding what pitch and time expansion, because we like that kind of aphasic sound that uh, time expansion gives without too much. And we never went past ever, I mean, in terms of time expansion, we never went more than like 5%. And pitch, we never went more than a semitone on any character. Um, and then um, I would bring them back into my studio and I would just very delicately compress, which of course brings up uh, the, the low frequency uh, range because it's usually recorded at a, at a lower level than, than I wanted it at. So there'd be a little bit of limiting, a little bit, a little bit of compression. And then I have a favorite um, LFE program called Low Ender. It's, I mean, a plug-in. And I would, I would take every single giant line and I would record the low ender back into the source. I would never use it as a, as a feed to an aux. I never relied on the subwoofer so that I would have 40 to 80 cycle component in the center channel in our dialogue or our giant dialogue pre-dubs. Then um, during the mix, we would selectively use our bass to get the mid lows like 120, 140 cycle stuff and we would ride that on every character depending on because you, know, you could never get the actor to stay right here. So as he worked here, we'd work our bass to, to get the, the sort of the mid lows. And um, that's it. We didn't, re we didn't use any EQ. No we stereo? No, because uh, the giants are always... I, I don't believe in stereo imaged dialogue unless it's a special effect or like voice of God thing. I mean, when characters speech, I speak, I, I want to be able to pan them. And, and we, did a, we did a lot of dialogue panning in Jack. Every character's production, ADR or giant voices is panned somewhere in the LCR spectrum. And I like that feeling of discreteness versus, I don't, I loathe MS and I loathe, um, you know, XY recording of almost anything because it's just soft. There's, there's nothing interesting about it. It's just, why well, put up this sort of washy image of something? Yeah, it fills some speakers, but it's not anywhere. I want point source sound to be point source, just that. And I'm going to pan, and I pan everything. I pan every sound effect, every piece of foley, every piece of dialogue. Atmos, different case. Atmos sit. And I record lots of six and seven and eight channel Atmos, and they sit as nice beds. And then I put point source things within that sort of a panorama, birds or cars or whatever, to give it spice and a feeling of uh, specificity. But I never, I don't like stereo dialogue as a recording. 
So I did, I processed all the giant voices, uh, the speaking giant voices, and then I did with my own voice all the non-speaking giants, the guys that roar and grumble and scream and attack and, and do all that stuff. And that was fun. I did it, my, I used this one Rode, NT1, it's, I can't remember, it's a big diaphragm, 150 volt power supply condenser mic, big fat condenser. And, um, and it was just, you know, I had a year and a half, so on any given, I could spend an entire day on like one line, and, and because I'm not very good. So I, you know, I could get, I could, because my studio is a screen, a perforated screen and a projector and a mixed console, so I could, I could, it was like my own ADR stage for free forever. I would, I would put up a scene on a loop and I'd just stand in front of the mic and be like, bleh, 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 and I'd do, make all these, no, that didn't quite fit. And I would do this ad nauseum. I mean, just make the stupidest noises for, for weeks on end because it's not, what I know from experience is that you can't subject actors to this. Um, to the, because I, I knew what I wanted in my head. I knew no actor would stand for my shenanigans. No, I don't want blah, blah, blah. I want blah, blah, blah. And I, no one's going to stand for that for more than 10 minutes. So as it often happens, as you all know, sometimes doing it yourself is just the best way. And my blah, blah, blah is no worse or better than a, a $1,000 an hour actor guy going blah, blah, blah. So... Let me start by saying that um, I really dislike Foley. I mean, I really dislike traditional Foley. It was a great idea in 1950, when did Jack Foley start, 56 or 57 or somewhere around there? It was a great idea. But, you know, at a, but in today's modern era of convolution reverbs and whatever else, the idea of recording audio for an acoustic thing called a movie soundtrack in a dead quiet room with a microphone in an unnatural position with a performer doing things that aren't anything like what the actors were doing doesn't make sense to me. And almost all Foley sounds awful. It is just awful. So it, it had gotten to the, it really reached this critical point where I had just, I couldn't listen to Foley. I couldn't go to Foley pre-dubs anymore. I couldn't listen to a lexicon reverb anymore. I, just, I had just had it. You could make sound sound like it really belongs in the real world by playing it back in an acoustic environment. So I extrapolated that and realized we got to do that with Foley. This Foley stage thing is nonsense. So... <laughs> I asked Frank Darabont, you know, I want to try this new thing. He said, yeah, Mark, you know, go, off, go, do, go do it. So my first thought, as I had done in little baby steps in other films, was to begin casting locations for the Green Mile that I would bring. And I began building a remote, synchronous, recording Foley rig with a giant screen TV and headphones, wireless headphones and a remote recording rig. One of the cool things I discovered at the beginning of that process is that was cheaper than going to a Foley stage. So already <laughs> I, was in, I got more Foley days and I knew my shit was gonna be better. Um, so I began casting locations and I started, I went through like these location scout guys who know where all the like places are. Where do you go to film things? So I said, where are some prisons? Get me a prison and he found me three prisons and an abandoned army barracks that resembled the Green Mile. It had concrete floors, a hallway about the same size, had some metal stuff we could erect. And so I began doing experiments with short little scenes from the Green Mile, walking a scene in situ in an acoustic environment and bringing it back to the studio and seeing how it laid up. And Frank just loved it. I mean, he just thought it was the coolest thing. So, um, as I was about to embark on the, I had finally picked an abandoned prison downtown. I've forgotten the name of it. We had found a location we liked, and we were getting ready to do it. When the producer heard about what we were doing, and he said, Mark, you know we still have the sets up for the mile, which is where 90% of the movie takes place. And I said, that's nice, but you know, it's a set. It's going to have sh shitty wooden floors and fake metal bars. And he said, no, no. Frank insisted on building the mile as a real prison. So it's a concrete floor and it's real metal bars and it's real brick walls. And we have all the props, we have the electric chair, we have all those rooms available and we're paying for them. What do you think about trying it? 
<laughs> so um, we we did a test. We had John Resch um, do a sequence on his Foley stage because I, I promised John he was going to do it one way or the other. Whether it was he, I was going to force him to go downtown into this really shoddy area and do it, or he was going to do it on his Foley stage. So we did a taste test. We did John walking a scene on the mile in his Foley stage, and we did a scene on the set, and we brought Frank in like, you know, double blind. You know, do you like cola A or cola B? And it was hands down, even nobody could believe the difference in quality and believability. I mean, it was literally because we got Tom Hanks shoes and his handcuffs and his baton and his uniform and his hat. We got all the original props and we did it on the ex in the exact same acoustic environment and we multi-miked it and we really, if somebody walked away down the mile, they walked 30 yards down the mile and you got that real acoustic feeling just like production. What a concept. Make it sound like production. And everybody loved it. And the, the, the amazing little gifts that kept happening were things like the lot had just been wired for fiber optics. So we could send fiber optic digital audio from stage four or five or whatever it was to Mary Jo in the Foley recording control room, she could still use the equipment she was used to and be really comfortable recording Foley. It was just that it was John was way over there and we developed a two-way talk system and these rolling monitors and it was, it was fantastic. It sounds, the, the, as I was telling you earlier, the foreign, you didn't have to touch a thing. It, it was like somebody had magically erased, like the karaoke machine had taken out all the dialogue and it was what they had shot during production. And it, it, was just the best sounding Foley ever. Jack Foley we did in Toronto at Footstep Studios because I, Andy Malcolm for a traditional Foley guy comes the closest to that because he uses real acoustics and he's got a Foley studio that's kind of designed to be the closest thing to that for something that's a real studio. And so we, like, we did a movie last year with him that took place in the winter and we were shooting in the winter and he went outside and did all our snow stuff outside and. He's just real adventurous that way, and he's got a, he's got a real, real good understanding of where Foley belongs. Um, so much so that I just send him reels, and I say, do it. I don't cue it, and I don't, I don't overload him with silly things that nobody would or should ever hear. So we're very efficient that way. He has this, he has the, I think he calls it the 20-foot rule. He doesn't, shoot, he doesn't shoot anything past 20 feet from the camera unless I ask for it. Uh, or if it's a plot point, and, um, and he does all this really nice acoustic stuff, and I always send him a crash down. I always do Foley after a temp dub. I always do little bits of Foley for temp dubs, but I always do a crash down of my effect stem from the temp dub and send it to him so that he knows this is the stuff you don't have to cover because Mark has effects that he really likes, because I, I hate waste. I hate I hate it when we waste time, and I hate it at a mix when you hear sound and they flam, you hear a, you know, a hand pat, it goes budik. It's like, well, there's, all right, there's one in effects, there's one in Foley, and the one in production got moved. Oh, fuck. I hate that moment. I hate mechanical wastes of time that can be so easily avoided by figuring these things out in advance. So I'm a nut. One of the things I insist on is right before, um, right after the temp dub, the dialogue editor has to do a fine sync pass on the cut dialogue so that forever and ever that hand pat is right there. It's never going to change because we've decided that is absolute sync. And then that dictates everything for Foley and effects from that day on. Dialogue gives us an effects crash down and the effects editors and the Foley guys work against that crash down for the rest of the project. And so if I'm told Foley to do the hand pat, only Foley does it, and usually I tell Dialogue, we've sunk to yours, now flop it out and put it in PFX, and we won't use it unless the director says, I just love the production there. And we make those qualitative decisions all along the way. We make hundreds of them of deciding what's better, PFX or Foley or sound effects. And when it comes to the dub, there's only one of anything. The only thing that there's two of is, it some, is an ADR line that the director can't decide about, or a sound design moment of something you know, you've never heard before and it could go this way, it could go that way. If he hasn't already heard it in my studio and we've made that decision, that's the only time we ever have those issues. So I, I'm, I'm a nut about Foley not duplicating stuff. I don't, I don't want the choices. I know what I want and uh, I don't, if I like the effects 
handcuffs, that's what it's going to be. I tell Foley, don't do the handcuffs. It's a waste of time. I'd rather have Foley spend more time figuring out a creative way to make a sound and make it better than have to do this carpet of coverage for me and uh, make me waste my time in the mixer's time. Because when you waste mixer's time, that's really bad because then you're not being creative in your mix. You're doing mechanical nonsense. That's foolish. <laughs> but it takes a little bit of experience. I mean, you have to have sort of a pretty good sense of what the director likes, first and foremost. What if you make the wrong choice? <laughs> you don't want the director to say more than three or four times, let's go back to those P effects. Why did you flop them all out? So you got to develop a sensibility for what that person likes, right? And have a good ear for what you think sounds good, too. You know, I can tell you this, that it's a diminishing curve that uh, with the advent of vi visual effects in the DI process, my, my intense time is where I'm like, I'm starting to really generate lots of sound design stuff and I got to play sequences for a director. Usually happens right around three to four weeks before a mix and that's when the director's starting to get overloaded with DI and VFX review sessions and I'm getting them less and less. So, um, there's, I can't give you any kind of number. One of the things that I insist on is a spotting session. That's kind of like, duh. You, you got to know what they want. You got to get inside their brain. Best, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I have great experiences most of the time. Two at the top are Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is one of the first movies I worked on, and, uh, the, uh, and, and Fifth Element because Luke's just sort of free reign to do whatever I wanted to do. And then Warrior last year, because Gavin is such a mensch, and he, he also, too, let me do whatever I wanted to do. You supervised um, Raiders? No, I was a line editor. Uh, Richard Anderson and Ben Burt supervised it, and they won Oscars for it. I was just a line cutter at that point. But um, at that, that was just when Richard Anderson, Stephen Hunter Flick, and I started our company that became Weddington Productions. It was a post-production company for a long time. And uh, we were just, we did everything together. There wasn't any real sort of, Richard was the supervisor, but we went out and recorded every day. We cut together, we designed together. We did the whole movie, the three of us, with Ben Burt. And uh, it was just a great collaborative experience. And, and it was that, those, it was the old days when they gave you a, 10 weeks, they give you a locked picture for 10 weeks. And then you went to the mix and just mixed it for like 10 weeks. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> when do you get that anymore? <laughs> so those were, those were really good ones. The best gift you can bring to a film and a director is your ideas and your honesty. And as long as you let that be your compass, I think you'll be really successful. The filmmakers are hungry for your ideas and want your honesty. But make sure you hone your craft so that you're delivering really good ideas. Make yourself a filmmaker first. Was that? It's fabulous. It's fabulous. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>